At The Renegade Economist, we seek out those who do think differently. Throughout his career, Roger Maverty hasn't ever subscribed to groupthink. This renegade spirit has meant that he's led organisations, designed hostile takeovers, and now written a tome called the Rule Breakers Book of Business. My first question to him honed in on something that adds misery to all of our working lives. I began by asking, have we had peak bullshit in business? Oh, I don't think you'll ever escape from peak bullshit in business. As a matter of fact, I think it's, it seems to be increasing the whole time. And in a way, the underlying philosophy of the book is a bit of a diatribe against the kind of onward march of jargon, bureaucracy, and actually caution in business. There's not a sense of adventure anymore. Should work be fun? Oh, please, yes. I don't think it is very often. I think, by and large, most people's office lives are ruled more by the emotion of fear than the emotion of hope. And I think that's really rather sad. Uh, One's much more productive when you're actually enjoying yourself. It's common sense. Revelation. You focus a fair bit on left brain and right brain. Can you just talk about the relevance? If creativity is the lifeblood of business, how either that's shifting or, or what your view is on this left brain, right brain divide? Well, thanks to... Uh, MRI scanning, we've learnt more in about the last five years than we did in the previous 50,000 about how the brain actually works. And it is in two separate halves. And it's kind of like a department store. Different bits function in different places. And largely what happens in the left brain is analytical processes. And it's about examining and understanding and organising what is there. And largely what happens in the right brain is imaginative processes and thinking about what could be there. So if you have somebody who's very left-brained, he might well be an extremely good accountant because he'll be precise and he'll have a sense of detail, but he's not going to be a creative person. And if you have somebody who's very right-brained, he might be a bit of a liability with a petty cash on a Friday lunchtime, but he will actually have new ideas and stimulate original thinking, and he will move things forward. So my observation is that we live in a world where increasingly left-brain thinking, quantification, analysis, counting stuff, is very important to the extent that imaginative thinking and new ideas are suppressed. And it's very depressing. If you talk to teachers, it's an interesting example. There is now so much political pressure on producing results which can be quantified so that this week's Minister of Education can prove that he was doing a better job than last week's, that actually the whole teaching syllabus and programme is being skewed and teachers are very demotivated. So that's just one example of the world slipping into a kind of absolute left-brain trap. Of course, you need both characteristics, but the reason for writing the book is really a cry from the heart that we need to be brave enough to be much more right-brained and to embrace right-brain values more. Do you agree with the idea that there's no surer way to get somebody to destroy a business than to give him or her a numeric target? Well, I think targets used well actually can be quite inspiring because business is competitive and if you have a clear target which you can if you stretch yourself beat and then you find yourself beating it that's very motivating so I'm not anti-targets as long as they're set at a level which are deliverable it's very demotivating to have a target which you spend the whole financial year knowing that you're never going to achieve because it kind of puts you in a position of guaranteed failure. Targets are really about what you might achieve, so I'm not against targets. My concern is much more that in working out how you might achieve something, there is a tremendous over-enthusiasm for analysis and research and a great deal of under-enthusiasm for creativity and new ideas and taking risks. James McKinsey of McKinsey Consulting fame said if it can be measured, it should be measured, then managed. Do you agree with that? He's really my bete noir, as a matter of fact, James McKinsey. I have to take my hat off to him that he built an amazing business 
and he's kind of created management consulting. Although I don't really understand what it's for, because I think if the chief executive of a business can't run it himself uh, with his team, I don't think he should hire somebody else to do it for him. I think he should stand down. But McKinsey did have this wonderful bit of absolute premium quality bullshit, which was to say to people, as long as you can measure something, you can manage it. And then he go on to say, and actually you can measure anything, QED, you can manage anything. Say you have a nervous chief executive, he's faced with a problem, he goes to McKinsey, McKinsey takes him through this, and the chief executive suddenly feels that as long as he signs the McKinsey contract, his problems are all going to go away. And it's a brilliant piece of salesmanship. But if you actually look at those two statements for more than 10 seconds, they're complete nonsense. I mean, to say that anything you can measure, you can manage, is just patently untrue. It's a rather morbid example. But if you talk to an oncologist running a cancer ward and say, do you have good measurement about the condition of your patients? You'll say, of course so. We've got blood tests and cell counts and MRI scans and CT scans and every amount of information you could think about. You then say, does that mean you can manage the condition of the patients? You'll sadly admit that in some cases the answer is yes, but in some cases the answer is no. And I know that's a rather morbid example, but I think it does make the point rather vividly that it's simply not true to say that being able to measure something enables you to manage it. And as for the idea that you can measure anything, well, if you're getting a new dining table from IKEA, you can measure the kitchen to make sure the dining table is roughly the right size. But the things which really matter in life, truth, beauty, love, can you measure them? No, of course not. Do you think that in business and in life, really, in many ways, uh, to be broader, we have been educated out of our intuition? Yeah, I think we have. I think there is a huge anxiety about risk. And actually, quite often in life, the biggest risk is not taking one. Uh, If you don't do anything, that's kind of a guarantee for failure. So you've got to take risks, but we live in a world where that is sort of frowned on. Part of my life, I work as a photographer, and I did a master's degree a few years ago, and there was great excitement when we had our degree show, and we were actually going to hang our, in quotes, masterpieces to the public gaze. And I had got a form I had to fill in. Bear in mind that we were supposed as students to stage this ourselves. What we had to do was to paint a wall white and then hammer some nails in it so the pictures could be hung on it. And I seriously had to fill in a form where I had to describe the tools that I would be using, namely paintbrush, paint, nail, and hammer. And I had to rate these uh, on a scale from 0 to 5 of the seriousness of an accident and the likelihood of an accident. And I thought, an intelligent visitor from Mars would think, I've stumbled on a completely insane planet. Get me back to Mars now. This is a crazy world we're living in, and somebody needs to stand up and say, stop it. Why can't a photographer just take a photograph and hang it on a wall? Why does he have to fill in a form saying he's safe with a paintbrush? You said that CFOs, chief financial officers, shouldn't really become CEOs. And I just want to tie back into this idea of risk. Often the CFO is most risk-averse bod in, in, in any business, or certainly when I've met them. Um, why should a CFO not become a CEO? Well, I think any business needs a kind of conjunction between a strong leader, because nothing will happen without that, really, and a good team around him, because a strong leader on his own is not enough. So you do need a good leader, and you do need a good team. And if you'll forgive the clumsy analogy, if you're running a football team, for example, you need different skills. You need a goalkeeper and you need a centre forward. And they're kind of different types of players. So a good chief executive will have a good team. And on it ought to be somebody who is the goalkeeper, who's essentially a defensive personality, who's there to stop things going wrong. And that typically will be the financial head. But he also needs people who are Aggressive personalities who are creative people who can, rather than stopping things go wrong, can actually make things go right. 
and that might be a sales or a marketing guy or a creative director or a design director, but already you're thinking, hang on a minute, in the hierarchy of most companies, the finance guy is seen as number two to the chief executive, and the marketing director is quite low down the pecking order round the board table, and a creative director or a design director doesn't exist in most companies. So the people whose job it is to invent and inspire uh, travel through corporate life tourist class, and the people whose job it is to be cautious and negative travel through life at the front of the plane. That doesn't seem to me right. One of the questions that you ask in the book is, does the morality go down as profits go up? No, it makes me cross whenever you hear that a big British company has made a big profit. There's kind of a sharp intake of breath as if somehow making money is a bad thing. I really wish people would think what profit is, and more importantly, not just what it, what it is, but where it goes to. Crudely, most businesses, once they've made a profit, split it three ways. Roughly a third might go back to the shareholders. And bear in mind that without their investment and the employment it brings, would never have been there in the first place. And also bear in mind that shareholders nowadays are typically people like insurance companies and pension funds. So if you have a pension, which you depend on when you retire, it's kind of in your interest that the pension fund should make good investments in profitable companies. So profit going to shareholders is excellent, I think. It's rewarding the people whose effort and money got the business going in the first place and insofar as it's rewarding pension funds it's helping you secure your own future the next chunk of profit goes back in the business just to give it some reserve and some financial stability and money to invest for growth and money to pay for more and better staff and so forth and the third chunk of profit goes in tax and I know most people also have a sharp intake of breath when the word tax is mentioned But I actually rather like tax because it pays for things like schools and hospitals and policemen and roads. And if you don't want to pay tax, that's fine. But don't imagine a world being enjoyable if there isn't a hospital to go to when you're ill or a school for your kids to be educated in. We need these things. They have to be paid for. Tax is what does it. And a big chunk of UK's tax revenues come from corporation tax. So when a business makes a lot of money, be pleased about it. The language has been corrosive, and the, the, the press haven't really helped, have they? Uh, well, the press are always wonderful and terrible at the same time. I mean, they are irresponsible, and it's been exposed again and again uh, over the whole hacking thing. Really, how shabbily and dishonestly, and sometimes criminally, they've behaved. But on the other hand, the thought of a tightly controlled press... Uh, is one step away from Putin's Russia. Uh, I'm sitting, I think, in in the presence of a world record holder, insofar as you've genuinely written the the shortest chapter in history, possibly. Uh, Would you like to read it out? Let me set it up by asking, how can one be sure that a project will fail? There is indeed a chapter with that heading, and I will read you the whole chapter. It is, appoint a committee. So that's three words. I haven't actually heard from Guinness World Records as to whether they put it in the book or not. So how how can one ensure that a project will fail, appoint a committee? Yeah, I mean, the underlying point is that for things to succeed, people need to have a sense of responsibility that they've got to make it succeed and a sense of empowerment that they've been given the job. And the whole point of having a committee is actually to undermine that because a committee is a group of people whose responsibility is shared. So if you give six people the task of solving a problem, they will generally imagine, each of them, that the other five are on the case. And if they get it wrong, they can kind of get it wrong together. So their responsibility and their blame is divided by six. Give one person a job Firstly, he is empowered. He knows he's got the authority to do it. And secondly, he feels the pressure of responsibility. He's got to deliver a result. So don't buy a dog and uh, bark yourself. The importance of delegation. 
Well, delegation is crucial in a business because normally what gets any business going is one or two strong personalities making a kind of entrepreneurial step in the dark. But once they've got the thing airborne, they then need to delegate to other people so that the business can grow. If they hoard all the power and all the energy to themselves, it's always going to be stifled. So if a business is going to grow, it's got to bring in new people and it's got to trust them to do their job. And delegation is very difficult because most people are quite control freaky and reluctant about passing on power because there's always the risk that the person you pass it on to is going to get it wrong. But of course, a good delegator knows that and takes that risk. The language in, in business is increasingly warped, and I'm sure you've got a very clear view on this. Um, plain English um, now is, uh, well, frankly, a rarity. Uh, why so much corporate jargon and nonsense? Well, I think corporate jargon is a kind of uh, defence measure. I'm kind of quite in favour of jargon in particular places where it's relevant. I used to uh, race a boat, uh, and I counted there were 15 different types of rope with 15 different names. And to somebody who's not into sailing, that would seem pretentious and unnecessary. <clears throat> but actually, if you're racing a boat on a windy day and you're coming up to a mark with several other boats weighing several tons coming close to you, you need to be able to part, communicate and pass instructions that people understand immediately. So if there are 15 types of rope, you need 15 different names. So the person that's got to do something knows which one you're talking about. And if you're a surgeon, uh, I imagine that every little scalpel and tool and weapon that you have in the theatre has got a particular name. So in specialist areas, jargon is actually quite helpful because it's identifying something very specific from one expert to another. But actually, business isn't really specialist. It's quite a generalist skill. And I think the reason that jargon exists in business is it's a kind of protective mechanism. Bad business people don't like confronting failure and they don't like admitting failure. Now my view is the opposite. If you don't confront failure you're never going to remove it. It's a bit like thinking by not going to the doctor you'll never be ill. It doesn't work like that. You have to be willing to confront failure which means you have to use language which admits that. But bad business people don't like to do that, so they never have a problem. They only have an issue. And they never talk about what's going to happen in the future because everybody knows that the future is an uncertain place and they don't like uncertainty. So instead of talking about the future, they say, going forward, which has a kind of sense of almost military purposefulness about it, which, of course, is completely misleading. Um, so there's this kind of arcane language which business people use really to make things look better than they are. You have to have a, a cliche that rubs you up the wrong way. I mean, is, is there one that stands out? What's the thing that really grates? Um, oh, God, how long have we got? Um, I can think of millions. One of the th Oddly enough, you may think it's trivial. One of the ones which I find most irritating is the word metric. For about 5,000 years... Uh, if you wanted the noun describing something which had been measured was measurement. It's a perfectly good word. But there's this sort of mid-Atlantic, button-down, left-brain thing that people now talk about metrics as if giving it a sort of new-look word makes it seem like a new science. It's just a, another word for measurement. And another one which is kind of running metric close for stupidity is people talking about optics. Now, I thought an optic was that thing in the pub which measured how much whiskey you get, and that's the proper use of the word, but it's now become used by mediocre businessmen to mean the presentation of something rather than the substance. So people will talk about the optics when what they really mean is it looks bad. If it looks bad, why don't they say it looks bad? You're quite emphatic. You say uh, better a mission than a mission statement. Uh, I think we can all agree uh, that mission statements are trite and frankly ridiculous. Uh, so why a mission? Well, I think things don't succeed in virtually any aspect of life if you don't have some clear kind of underlying ambition. Um, 
you know, if you get on the tennis court with your mate on Sunday morning, not really wanting to win, frankly, you probably won't. And if a business doesn't have a clear objective, it won't succeed. So every activity needs some sense of a kind of vision, and mission is a perfectly good word for that. So businesses need to have a target, a vision of where they're going, because that's a kind of central aspect of leadership, is to know what the destination for the journey is. The difference between a mission and a mission statement is a mission is a kind of passion that comes from the heart, and a mission statement is a rather arid document, uh, usually written by companies that don't actually have a mission, to obscure that fact. Um, you, you talk about the joy of laziness. Now, this is at a time, again, contrarian, because Sheryl Sandberg is, is writing Lean In. There are various motivational speakers all over the world telling you to get out of bed at five in the morning, do all manner of exercise, and then get in the office, do 26-hour days. Talk to me about laziness and its effectiveness. Well, I think it gets back to what I was saying earlier, that too much of our office life is driven by the emotion of fear, and not enough by the emotion of hope. People who are driven by fear are anxious and worried about what other people will think of them. And the way that anxiety translates into their own behaviour is they get into the office terribly early and they stay terribly late and they take work home in their briefcase at the end of the day because they're anxious that if they don't give it their all, they're not going to be seen by others to be doing a great job. But the truth of the matter is giving something your all isn't measured in how many hours you spend doing it. It's measured in whether you get the right answer. And you're much more likely to get the right answer to a difficult problem if you're fresh than if you're stale. So I think if you overwork and overthink, you get overtired. And that's not likely to produce a good result. It's really that simple. Talk to me about the power of no not just in business, in life generally. Nobody likes to uh, deny people things. People use euphemisms when they want to reject something to make it seem not too bad because they don't want to hurt other people's opinions or uh, sensitivities, I should say. But actually, if somebody's got something wrong, the truth is it's better just to confront that because if you don't say this isn't good enough, you can't have what you want, you leave people with a very misleading sense that they're closer to the target than they really are. And part of leadership is being brave enough to be blunt with people, and if they haven't got it right, or if they have a demand which can't be met, being honest with them. It doesn't mean you have to be rude about it, it just means you have to be straightforward. And in a way, if you think about it, turning ideas down because they're not good enough is the only way you're ever going to get to one which is good enough. And having spent a lifetime in advertising, I'm vividly aware of that. We, as a race, suffer from paralysis by analysis. And you've written a chapter which is uh, entitled, Done is Better Than Perfect. Can you just talk around this area? Well, that phrase, done is better than perfect, I was amazed to discover, was emblazoned on the wall of Steve Job's office. And when you look at the amazingly beautiful products which Apple make, and clearly he was the progenitor of that, it was his vision and his inspiration which drove the company that way, they look absolutely perfect. So I was rather surprised that he would have a rubric like that on his wall. Uh, But I think what he clearly meant is that we can spend ages talking about something in a search for perfection And the truth is, you will never produce something. And actually, for something to be good, it's got to exist. So at some point, you've got to stop discussing and just do it. And I use a similar expression, which is a bad decision on Monday usually makes more money than a good decision on Friday. Uh, And I say that for one simple reason. It's true. You've got to get on and make things happen. And an awful large part of office life is a kind of talking shop, and it's a waste of time. 
We're seeing a huge swing back to self-employment, entrepreneurship, uh, and people going out and starting businesses. And a lot of people who are, uh, at the moment, holed up in corporates are not really enjoying it. There's a, a kind of desperation that uh, runs, I think, through a lot of corporate structures at the moment. And people often want the apparent freedom that running your own business brings. Um, should anybody go and just start a business? I don't think everybody should start a business because it requires a particular kind of temperament. I think it requires a passion to do that. And if you don't feel that, you shouldn't pretend that you do because other people think it looks sexy. You should stay comfortably where you are. But I think if you do have that passion, it's a great sadness not to take the risk to let to release it and put it to work for you. So I think there's probably quite a lot of people who spend their whole lives wondering how things would have been if they'd actually had the guts to start their own business. So yeah, I would encourage people to be entrepreneurial if that's the way they're leaning. The crucial role of skirt length in business strategy. Talk to me. Ah yes, well there is a chapter in the book which is a true story um, and I think it's a brilliant example of right brain thinking succeeding where left brain thinking might fail. Uh, it happened in 1968 in France, and if you're a social historian, you'll know that that was a time of massive industrial unrest in France. There, were, uh, there was a general strike. Students and workers were rioting together uh, against the police. There were cars upturned in the street. It was absolute chaos. It's hard to imagine now. Uh, Paris is now so discreet and conservative, but it was a country at war with itself. And there was a general strike, so all factories and all offices were closed, including the offices of Procter & Gamble, the big American uh, household products company who'd opened in Paris very successfully uh, about a decade before and was run by a very brilliant Englishman called Tom Bauer, uh, who was unusual in the sense that he was a very right-brained guy at the top of a very large corporation. And Tom thought, how on earth can my business survive here in the face of a general strike? And he imagined his rivals at Unilever would probably be setting up committees studying spreadsheets, and he thought that was probably not likely to be the answer. So instead, he picked up the phone and he rang up a very pretty secretary in his office and asked her out for lunch. And he explained his plan to her over lunch, and she agreed. And the next day, she went to the office, which was surrounded by pickets, wearing rather a short skirt and a very shy smile. And he, she explained to the pickets, who were men, that she knew she wasn't allowed in the office, but because of the industrial unrest and the rioting in the streets, her two tiny children had been sent off to the country uh, to stay with Granny. And she missed them terribly. There were photos of them on her desk. Could she go in and get the photos? So... The pickets being men did what all men do when they see a pretty girl with a shy smile and a short skirt. They switched their brains off and let her in. And she came back ten minutes later with a parcel which they assumed contained the photographs. What it actually contained was the packaging artwork for P&G's two leading brands. And within 24 hours that was at a printer's in Italy uh, and P&G put the Italian factory on evening and weekend overtime to produce as much product as possible in French packaging. It was stockpiled in warehouses they rented on the Italian side of the border with France, where they also rented a fleet of trucks. The minute the strike stopped, the P&G trucks thundered over the border, absolutely packed to the ceiling with product. And of course, every shop and store and grocer and supermarket in France had empty shelves for weeks and P&G were welcomed with open arms everywhere. And it was a huge commercial success for them. So I think it's a good example of taking a risk and being a right brain to solve quite an intractable problem. It is absolutely no uh, coincidence that the tagline for the book is Win at Work by Doing Things Differently. Roger Maverty, author of The Rule Breakers Book of Business, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.